Welcome to Scientists in the Spotlight. I am your host, Brianna Dignard, and today's special guest is the formidable physicist, the golden scientist, whose life story is so unbelievable, it will have you on the edge of your seats. I'm talking about Elise Meitner. Give it up, everybody. Thank you, Elise, for so much for being here today. We're, we're so privileged to be able to have the chance to talk to you. Thank you for having me today. I'm very excited to be able to be here and answer these questions all about my life. Yes. What made you decide that, yes, physics was for me? Let's, let's get into why you chose physics in the first place. Yes, so when I was a kid, I, I went outside and I saw a, a puddle with some, with some oil on it, a puddle of water and it had all of these colors in it and i was entranced i wanted to know what was causing those colors i found out the answer and wanted to know after that i wanted to know everything what caused everything in the universe and physics physics has the answer to everything in the universe or it eventually will have the answer to everything in the universe and that's how i ended up choosing physics oh, what a what a great story to tell i love I love that you're saying that physics is the why of the universe. That's so powerful. And I hear that you got the second ever, let's see, physics doctorate hands it out at, at the University of Vienna. Tell, tell us some more about that. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> oh, you, you say that like it was so easy. Like the University of Vienna was just handing out those, those doctorates. No, no, no. So I did, girls in, in Austria when I was growing up didn't really receive an education past the age of 14. You know, they decided that after 14 that the girls knew everything they needed to know to, to have a family, to, to have a household. So they stopped educating them. Um, so I spent a couple of years where I wasn't able to go to school, but finally my father was able to give me a tutor so that I could study for the university, university exams. I crammed like eight years worth of learning into two years. It was crazy. Uh, my siblings would make fun of me if I hadn't studied enough. But I took the entrance exam from the university, passed it, you know, passed it. Only four of us women passed it that year. And women weren't, weren't very common in university, but we held down the fort well. I showed them, showed, showed those middle students who's boss. <laughs> Carl's couldn't get educated past the age of 14. That is. That's ridiculous. All right, so you passed, you got the university, got your physics doctorate, and then you decided to move away from Vienna, away from Austria to Germany. What made you decide to do that? Everybody around me thought physics was dead. They were like, oh, physics is dead science. We have learned everything that we need to know in, science, in physics, right? And I'm like, there's, there's, there's four physics professors in all of Austria-Hungary. So physics, not a great field in Austria. But I'm like, guys, the Curies are living it up right now in France with all that radioactivity and radium stuff. They're discovering new elements. They are doing things we never even imagined possible. And we're out here calling physics dead? I mean, Austria is doing physical things. Austria is doing terrible things in the physics department. So why not Germany? I mean, Germany has Albert Einstein. They have the birth of quantum mechanics. Right as everybody around me is declaring that physics is a dead science, Austria's blowing that thing wide open, so why not go there? Why not go there and pursue what I couldn't have done in Austria? <laughs> Physics being dead, oh my gosh. That's a crazy to think about. Yeah. Physics is dead. What a crazy thing to say on the like literal forefront of like the entire revolution of, of physics as we know it today. Ah, hindsight's 2020. <laughs> And while you were in Germany, it says here, let's see, you discovered protactinium? Is that, is that how you say that? What on earth does discovering protactinium even mean? Yeah, so then I ended up in Germany and I started working with this chemist named Otto Hahn. And actually, well, it's not really a funny story, but kind of funny story. I wasn't even allowed in the building that he worked in. Like women were not allowed in his building. So I had to work in the basement, which used to be a carpenter shop, and they wouldn't even let me enter in the same door as the rest of the men. I had to enter in by a side door. 
And then I was sitting there analyzing data from experiments that I couldn't even watch because they went on upstairs. Otto Hahn thinks he's a great scientist, but he could have never done that. <laughs> so we were working together and uh, we were trying to study these radioactive elements, which are really tricky to study because they, they disappear really fast. They, they undergo radioactive decay. And ever since the Curies discovered radium and polonium, like finding new elements is the hot new trend. So we're out here trying to find a new element and we managed to isolate protactinium which is in, you'll find it on the periodic table of elements now, the precursor to actinium. And it was a lot of hard work, but contributed to that lo lovely table. So that's pretty great. <laughs> wow. Discovering your own element on the periodic table of elements. What a baller move. We have to take a short commercial break and we'll be back with Lise Meitner's nail biting escape from Germany. You won't want to miss this. Welcome back everyone. We are just here interviewing the amazing physicist Lise Meitner. So Lise, let's see where we left off. So, so you had built this huge career in, Aus in, in, in Germany, my bad, became head of your own radio physics department, and then the next thing you knew, some guy named Hitler was annexing Germany, banning all Jewish people from working, and banning academics from leaving the country of Germany. So you had to get out of there pretty fast in a really delicate situation and uh, what was what was it like to have to deal with that and what was it like to leave germany yeah so being of jewish heritage i i was a little concerned when when hitler came in and came out with these these anti-semitic laws but it didn't con i wasn't as concerned i thought it was i'm an austrian citizen i'm not a german citizen i'm a little bit protected and it was it was really scary when uh, I lost my Austrian citizenship because Germany took over Austria and I didn't have a valid passport and anybody's, uh, any academic was basically banned from leaving the country. And that's when I was like, this is serious and we need to get out of this situation. So luckily my, I had some friends in the Netherlands, some Dutch friends, they, they got, struck up an agreement with their government to let me come into the Netherlands without a passport, without a visa. And so the night of my escape, I worked really late in my office because I didn't want to raise any suspicion because I was definitely probably considered a fleeing the country risk. So I worked, worked late in my office, went home, and in front of Otto Hahn and a couple other friends, I packed two suitcases full of only light summer clothes as if I was just going away for a, a two week summer vacation had to leave everything else that I owned behind, all my scientific writings behind. And I got on a train, met up with a colleague, and we took the train out of the country. Got stopped a couple of times to look at my passport, which wasn't really valid. And luckily nobody said anything and I, I made it to the Netherlands safety and safely. And from there, I ended up uh, with Niels Bohr for a little bit of time and then ended up in, in Sweden. But the isolation of Sweden and kind of not as great working environment and conditions really wasn't good for my reputation or building it back up. I wasn't able to get credit for a lot of things that I've done and just kind of, I worked all my life to build up that career and kind of got taken away from me in an instant along with my homeland you know i lived in germany for 31 years i was 59 and all of a sudden i had to i had to start all over again and it it sucked <laughs> you know i not say anybody thinks it's ideal but when you're 59 and built a whole career it's probably even worse than if you were just starting out and having made a name for yourself oh i can't even i can't even imagine that is a crazy story and i'm I mean, it's really just so lucky that you could even be here right now to, to tell us your life story. It could have been so easily, like, not made it out of Germany. That's, that's crazy. Oh, I know you ended up stuck in Sweden, which probably wasn't the most ideal of circumstances, but you kept up your collaborations with Otto Hahn in, in Germany. Why don't you tell us about those experiments? Those sound pretty interesting. Prior to leaving Germany, Otto Hahn and I and some other people had been working on these 
atom bombardment experiments. Basically, you're taking uranium, hitting it with more neutrons, and trying to make something heavier than uranium. And we weren't the only ones doing this. I mean, again, very trendy to try to make new elements in that day. The Joliet Curies were doing it in France. Uh, the Italians were also doing these experiments. We kept finding something weird. Instead of making a heavier element, we started discovering these like lighter fragments of elements. So if you hit uranium with a neutron, we weren't getting something heavier than uranium. We were getting something about half the size of uranium. And we, this was, we didn't really know what to do with it. We just kind of kept repeating our experiments and really trying to make sure that what we were observing was correct. We didn't have a, an experimental issue somewhere. And so this is, was experiments going on before I left Germany. And when I left Germany, I still kept up with these experiments via correspondence with Otto Hahn. And he sent me a letter one day and was like, no, I did, I did the science. And there's no way this is incorrect. We are getting the element barium, which is about approximately half the weight of uranium. Like this is the element we're getting. We're not getting something heavier than uranium. We're getting an element that is about half the weight of uranium. So I'm out on a walk with my nephew, Otto Frisch, and he's skiing, I'm walking. And then all of a sudden it clicks in our brains and we start <laughs> writing and doing some math in the snow. And we figured out that if you combine together the numbers of protons and neutrons in lighter elements, you could build a uranium atom. So what we figured out was the uranium atom was not taking in the neutron and getting heavier. It was taking in the neutron and splitting into two parts. So then you had a, two particles, approximately half the size of uranium because the uranium atom had split in half. And this was the discovery, the idea of nuclear fission. And there was a whole lot of energy that went into that split, which we experienced when we dropped those bombs on Japan, harnessing that energy. And it's terrible that discovery got used for, for something like that, but it was a fundamental and momentous discovery for how nuclear physics works, that atoms could split themselves apart. Wow, so you like, I mean, you were in the ground level of, of nuclear fission. Like, you, you, you mean, you're the one who came up with nuclear fission. I am, oh gosh, I don't learn that in school. <laughs> you came with all this great stuff. You had this amazing career in physics, but you didn't get recognition for nuclear fission. You didn't get the Nobel Prize in 1944 for it. So how does it feel to have other people get credit for your, maybe like life, what well, some could consider maybe your lifetime discovery? So yeah, the big elephant in the room, not getting the Nobel Prize for nuclear fission. Yeah, I mean, that really sucked. I had spent 60 years trying to build up my career and had gained quite the reputation in physics. And then that all disappeared with, with World War II and having, and I mean, a lot of my success was really due to Otto Hahn trying to support me and really demanding that I did get the academic credit for, for what I had done or what we had done together. So when he denied my contributions to the field of nuclear fission and basically anything that happened World War II onwards, that, that really hurt. Like he, he knew what I was capable of. We had worked as collaborators for 30 years and now he's out here just denying my skills as a physicist. So yeah, I mean, what else can you say other than the fact that sucks and I really, I expected better out of him. Thank you so much for your time on the show today, Lise. We really enjoyed having you here and hearing your story. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me here today. I really enjoyed getting to talk about my story and inspiring more people to join the field of physics. Whoa, physics! <laughs> Next up, we'll be interviewing Otto Hahn and asking him, did he really deserve that 1944 chemistry Nobel Prize about nuclear fission? Wait, what? Stay tuned to find out and keep it sciencey.